Hello everyone and welcome to Close Reading Classic Literature with me, Dr Octavia Cox. Today I'm going to be considering Jonathan Swift's self-penned epitaph written on his memorial gravestone in which Swift refers to his own savage indignation. And I want to unpick Jonathan Swift's reference to his indignation. And remember that these are the words that Swift chose to be his epitaph, his last words, the words he wanted to be remembered by forevermore. And Swift chose savage indignation. And I want to examine Swift's indignation as an allusion to the classical satirist Juvenal and consider what this reveals about Swift's use of satire and how this might help us better understand some of Swift's satirical writing. So sometimes I think Jonathan Swift's satire can be read as off-puttingly brutal, perhaps, and relentless and almost humanity-hating. And I want to defend Swift against those charges, against those charges of being hopelessly cynical. Swift was often accused of misanthropy and the Oxford English Dictionary defines a misanthrope as someone who is a hater of mankind, a person who distrusts and avoids other people. And Jonathan Swift was accused of this in his own lifetime. And indeed, he makes a joke about it in his playful autobiographical poem verses on the death of Dr. Swift written by himself when he's writing a poem imagining that he's imagining himself in the future when he's dead and what people will say about him. And in the second edition, he adds this line because of the accusations of misanthropy. Alas, poor Dean, his only scope was to be held a misanthrope. But as I've said, I'm going to defend Swift to some extent against these charges of misanthropy. Remember, if you like what I do here on my channel, do please subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you'll be notified when my videos go live weekly. And do hit the thumbs up. It really does help me out in YouTube's algorithm so that they show my videos to more people. In his will, written in May 1740, when Swift feared that he was losing his sanity, but five years before he actually died, on the 19th of October 1745, Jonathan Swift penned his own epitaph. He penned his own inscription, his own memorial. And he penned this inscription in Latin. Jonathan Swift also stipulated exactly how he wanted this memorial this gravestone, this tombstone engraved, and exactly where he wanted it situated within St. Patrick's Cathedral, where he was buried. So Jonathan Swift was the dean, which is the head of St. Patrick's Cathedral in Dublin, Ireland. And this is a significant, important ecclesiastical position. St. Patrick's Cathedral is the national cathedral for the Church of Ireland. And this is the text of Jonathan Swift's will. I desire that my body may be buried in the great aisle of the said cathedral, St. Patrick's, on the south side, under the pillar, next to the monument of primate Narcissus Marsh. He had been, Narcissus Marsh had been the Archbishop of Armagh and the Archbishop of Dublin. And the term primate here doesn't mean monkey or mammal, but primate is the title of honour denoting the ceremonial precedence in the church. So he wants to be buried next to the, one of the people who had been one of the highest people in the Church of Ireland. Three days after my decease, this is when he wants to be buried, he wants to be buried three days after my decease as privately as possible at 12 o'clock midnight and that a black marble of he didn't include the number of square feet uh, and seven feet from the ground fixed to the wall may be erected with the following inscription in large letters, deeply cut and strongly gilded. And he then included the inscription that he wanted. And Swift's memorial remains in place today in St. Patrick's Cathedral. And here it is, the inscription, and I'll read it in English. Here is deposited the body of Jonathan Swift Doctor of Sacred Theology of this cathedral church, the Dean, where savage indignation 
can no longer lacerate his heart. Go, traveller, and imitate, if you can, one who strove with all his might to vindicate, to champion liberty. So before I analyse and close read this text in a little more detail, I'm going to outline some important sort of introductory aspects of satire. In terms of etymology, the term satire has roots in the Latin satis, which means enough. And it's the same derivation as the word satisfied. So when you're satisfied, you've had enough. And what is satire? What is having enough? Very simply, satire is literature which examines folly and or vice and exposes it as ridiculous and or contemptible. Satire uses laughter as a weapon. As well as provoking laughter, however, satire is also highly entangled with ideas of morality. So moral right, moral wrong, moral good, moral bad. And it can be said fundamentally to have a moral purpose. So it's not just about being rude to or about other people. It's not just laughing or mocking other people, not just exposing and laughing at people shamelessly and cruelly, but laughing with a purpose, pointing out vice and immorality. So you have to have a justified target. Otherwise, it's simply being unkind and cruel and laughing at other people and essentially a kind of abuse of power. So there has to be a moral, legitimate reason behind your laughing at somebody else. Thinking about the moral purpose of satire might help us to explain two aspects of Jonathan Swift's life that might initially seem contradictory. So on the one hand, you've got the idea that Swift was the dean, the ecclesiastical head of a cathedral, and furthermore, a very significant, important cathedral. St. Patrick's, as I've said, is the National Cathedral of the Church of Ireland. Swift had a very important institutional position and one might imagine therefore that he would teach Christian ideas or preach Christian ideas of love, kindness, tolerance, forgiveness, mercy etc. On the other hand of course you've got the Swift that produced virulent, scathing, brutal, rude, satirical attacks against individuals and institutions. And the caustic nature of Swift's satire might seem to be at odds with his institutional role. We might compare Jonathan Swift's epitaph, for example, the inscription that refers to his savage indignation with the temperate, woolly, rather generic words on the tombstone inscription of Narcissus Marsh, who I mentioned earlier, and who Swift stated explicitly in his will that he wanted his memorial epitaph to be next to. So Marsh's inscription reads, it's very lengthy, I won't read all of it, but some of it reads that he served his own generation by the counsel of God and served the counsel of God in his own generation. And this is far more usual <laughs> on a tombstone, if less interesting than what Swift chose. But actually, if we think of satire as having a moral purpose to expose vice, to expose immorality, then Swift's religious and literary satirical life might make more sense together. So I'm just quickly going to run through two kinds of satire derived from classical models. Essentially, there is Horatian satire, 65 to 8 BC, and Juvenilian satire from Juvenal, who was another Roman poet who lived a bit later, from about 60 to about 130 AD. What is Horatian satire? So I've put that there in green. So very essentially, it examines folly to expose it as ridiculous. The purpose of Horatian satire is to laugh people out of their own folly and absurdity and ridiculousness. We might think, for example, of Mr. Bennett's line in Jane Austen's Pride and Prejudice when he says of Mr. Collins in this particular case, for what do we live but to make sport for our neighbours and laugh at them in our turn? 
So Mr. Bennett here is advocating a Horatian idea that laughter keeps society's excesses and ridiculousnesses in check. You laugh at your neighbours when they are absurd, your neighbours laugh at you when you are absurd, and so everyone is kind of kept in line by laughing at folly and exposing what is ridiculous. So that's Horatian satire. What about juvenilian satire? I put that in red. It's much harsher. It examines vice to expose it as contemptible. You can see Horatian satire is concerned with folly and what's ridiculous. Juvenilian satire is concerned with vice and what is contemptible. It's a much stronger, much harsher form of satire. Juvenilian satire also is more public focused than Horatian satire. So it exposes public figures in public life, especially those in positions of power over other people. It's caustic and brutal. It lacerates and scourges humanity, humans, for their failures and for their immorality. Contempt, as I've said, is a very strong feeling. It implies condemnation and judgment, righteous rage. And we might think, for example, of Jonathan Swift's A Modest Proposal from 1729, which is a mock serious political pamphlet that advocates eating children as a cure for Ireland's desperate poverty. It's a scathing attack, a juvenilian satire, on the immorality of the ruling class in their indifference to the plight of the poor. It's juvenilian satire because it's exposing the vice, the moral failing of that ruling class and deems it contemptible that they are so indifferent to the plight of the poor. So very, very essentially, you might laugh with someone in a Horatian satire, but you would not laugh with somebody in Juvenilian satire. You might laugh at, you might scorn others in Juvenilian satire. In his epitaph, Jonathan Swift refers, as I've said, to his savage indignation. And this is an explicit reference to the satire of Juvenal. By the 18th century, when Swift was living and writing, Juvenal had long been associated with expressing indignation at contemporary society. And just as Juvenal had been indignant at the corruption, the greed, the impious behaviour of the ruling class in Rome, so Jonathan Swift was indignant at the corruption, the greed and the impious behaviour that he saw in public life in modern day Britain and Ireland. And remember, of course, that Jonathan Swift lived in the neoclassical period, as it's called. So the new classics where the writers of the period really looked back to and drew on writers of the classical age, in this case, Juvenal. Another poet, John Dryden, also drew on Juvenal. He was Dryden was the great poet of the generation before Jonathan Swift. And indeed, he had been the poet laureate. And Dryden outlines the difference between Horatian and Juvenilian satire in his discourse concerning the original and progress of satire from his translations of the satires of Juvenal, which was published in 1693. The source of Juvenal is more poignant to create in us an appetite of reading him. The meat of Horace is more nourishing, but the cookery of Juvenal is more exquisite, so that granting Horace to be the more general philosopher, we cannot deny that Juvenal was the greater poet. I mean in satire. His thoughts are sharper. His indignation against vice is more vehement. So there we go again, this association of indignation with Juvenal. His spirit has more of the Commonwealth genius. He treats tyranny and all the vices attending it as they deserve with the utmost rigour. And consequently, a noble soul is better pleased with a zealous vindicator of Roman liberty. And we'll remember that Swift's epigraph reads, one who strove with all his might, so zealously, to vindicate liberty. So Swift sees himself like Juvenal as a vindicator, a zealous vindicator of liberty. So Dryden says, consequently, a noble soul is better pleased with a zealous vindicator of Roman liberty than with a temporising poet, a well-mannered court, that is Horace. He also says slightly later in this preface, Horace 
means to make his reader laugh. Juvenal always intends to move your indignation so that the reader should become indignant as well as the poet who's writing the satire. And this idea of Juvenal's indignation filters into the poetry itself, so it features in Juvenal's satires. And this is from the very first satire, from John Dryden's translation. What indignation boils within my veins, when perjured guardians proud with impious gains, choke up the streets too narrow for their trains. So this is juvenile. What indignation boils within my veins, that it's ever ready to boil over, to explode, this indignation. And it's in his blood and all the associations of, of feelings running through your veins. It kind of pumps through your body. When perjured guardians, so perjured liars, when lying guardians, guardians, people who, you know, the lawmakers, the officials, the people who are in charge of the rulers of a state or a nation or a city or whatever, when lying guardians, proud with impious gains. So the idea of immoral again, with immoral gains, choke up the streets too narrow for their trains. So the idea of the streets, the places where the people congregate, but these guardians, these officials can't fit within. They, they can't go amongst the streets. They think they're too important for the streets. There are too many of them to go even along the streets. They choke up the streets. And the implications of choke, they're sort of killing off those people in the streets. Too narrow for their trains, too narrow for their retinue. So all the hangers on are included as well in this. So it's not just the lying impious immoral guardians it's all those who hang off them as well who don't tell them that they are corrupt that they are impious that they are liars and juvenile as you can see is indignant at the hangers on too at those people who follow in the trains and one of the crucial lines from this first satire of juveniles is si natura negat facit indignatio versum. That translates roughly as if nature denies, indignation makes the verse. So in other words, if talent is lacking, then indignation will inspire my poetry. This idea that indignation compels juvenile to write. He can't not write because this indignation boils within his veins and that makes him write. Whether he's good or not isn't the point. If nature denies, that doesn't matter. He has to write. He has to tell his indignation. And the same is true for Jonathan Swift. Jonathan Swift wrote to Alexander Pope, the other great writer, great poet of the same period, the neoclassical period. And Swift wrote on the 29th of September 1725, as Swift was putting the finishing touches to his great satirical novel, Gulliver's Travels. And Swift wrote to Pope in this famous off-cited quotation, the chief end I propose to myself in all my labours is to vex the world rather than divert it. So I think it's important to note that he says that it's in all his labours, his satirical writing, his religious duties, everything he does has this same end, that he doesn't divide the two. He also says he wants to vex the world rather than divert it. We might think of vex being juvenilian, divert being Horatian because vex is or seems hostile and aggressive and deliberately contrarian. You know, to say I want to vex the world seems deliberately contrarian. And it implies perhaps a rage at and a hatred of humanity, misanthropy. And this rage and hatred is directed towards the world because the world needs to be disrupted, needs to be agitated. The world needs to be made angry at its vices rather than diverted by them is Swift's point. And in this sense, Swift refers to the two meanings of diverted. So one meaning is to draw attention away from the main point, the serious point. So you draw attention away from that, you're diverted from focusing on what's important. And the other meaning of divert is to entertain, 
and to amuse. If you find something very diverting, then you find it very funny. So Swift is drawing on both of those when he says that he wants to vex the world rather than divert it. He doesn't want to amuse and entertain, and he doesn't want to take people away from the main key serious point about which he thinks people should be vexed. They ought to be vexed about it. They ought to be indignant about it. I want to consider Swift's stated purpose to vex the world in the light of his epitaph, where savage indignation can no longer lacerate his heart. Go, traveller, and imitate, if you can, one who strove with all his might to vindicate liberty. Swift's satire, I fear, can sometimes feel relentless and cynical, vexing the world from a place of sneering superiority and a kind of smug, self-satisfied contempt, perhaps. But I actually find Swift's epitaph compelling and helpful in terms of understanding the feeling, the frustration behind Swift's use of satire. So I don't see it as coming from a cold, sneering position from a distance, but I think this epitaph highlights his sense, Swift's sense of personal torture. So if we compare Juvenal's indignation boiling in his veins, that image seems full of potential aggression, that it might boil over, that it might come out. But Swift's indignation here, he talks about lacerating his own heart. Lacerating meaning tearing, cutting up. So he's really highlighting here that his indignation tears him apart. And in a sense, the fact that Swift feels such pain, so much so that he sees death as a relief from that pain, he, you know, that he says, I've finally gone where savage indignation can no longer lacerate my heart. I finally died. I finally don't have to feel this pain anymore. So the fact that he references this this kind of release from the pain that he feels at feeling this indignation is evidence that he is, in fact, the opposite of being a misanthrope, the opposite of being a cynic. So the Oxford English Dictionary defines a cynic, one who is cynical, as one who shows a disposition to disbelieve in the sincerity or goodness of human motives and actions, or the impossibility of human goodness, in other words. And because if you're cynical about human nature, then you're really apathetic and indifferent to the badness of human nature. A cynic and a misanthrope would apathetically shrug his or her shoulders when encountering vice, but not so swift. He can't turn the other cheek. The vice of humanity lacerates his heart. And it's that pain that he feels that drives his satire, that compels him to vex the world in order to try and instigate change. And as he says in his epitaph, go and imitate if you can. He's trying to instigate further change even after he's dead. And the allusion to Juvenal in Swift's epitaph suggests that Swift means to say that his savage indignation compelled him to write as it had Juvenal, even while it tore him apart to contemplate. For Jonathan Swift, satire then is a compulsion. It's almost a moral duty, a moral imperative. Go, traveller, and imitate, if you can, one who strove with all his might to vindicate liberty. We all fail in our moral duty if we merely laugh when we encounter vice if we are merely diverted by the world rather than vexed by it. In this sense, you can see that his, the implication is that Horatian satire is just not good enough. It's just not good enough to laugh at the follies of the world and gloss over the vice and the contempt that you feel. So I see Jonathan Swift's savage indignation then sympathetically. To remain savagely indignant about injustice, even when that injustice seems perpetual and never ending, to keep fighting and to continue to feel your heart pained and lacerated by the injustice, the vice, the immorality you see, in fact shows a deep 
love and belief that humanity could be better. So I think it shows a deep love for humanity rather than a hatred of it, even though that love for his fellow man is expressed very differently from how it usually is on gravestones. But to me, hatred of humanity would be to turn the other cheek and to say, well, that's just the way that it is. But actually, it shows a deep, profound love for humanity to continue to feel indignant about injustice. In the words of John Dryden, it is a noble soul who seeks to be a juvenilian, zealous vindicator of liberty, who continues to feel lacerating, savage indignation. Thank you very much indeed for listening. I really hope that this video has made you think about Jonathan Swift's use of satire and his determined vexing of the world stemming from a profound love of humanity rather than a hatred for it. Remember, if you like what I do here on my channel, do please subscribe and like the video by clicking the thumbs up button and do leave any comments that you have below. I really do love hearing from you. 